So the first Sunday after Easter, uh, it's an interesting Sunday because we are fresh off the worldwide celebration and what we could call cherishment of Resurrection Sunday. Uh, it is the epicenter. It is the greatest day on the Christian calendar, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Christmas, wrongly, gets a lot of the spotlight. Easter is ultimately where it's at. Pastor Brianna and I were talking a couple weeks ago, if you take Christmas out of the Bible, um, you lose about two chapters in the New Testament. If you take Easter out of the Bible, you lose the entire New Testament. Um, it's a big deal. And so this week I found myself wondering how long before the Easter high wears off. How long does that take? Is it a day? Is it a week? Does it never happen? Uh, someone even said to me this week, on Wednesday, so midweek, that they were suffering from the post-Easter blues. An honest, and I appreciated the honesty, but sort of confusing response to Easter. Like, uh, I was imagining the, the apostles doing that shortly after the resurrection. Just, my goodness, I don't know. Jesus is alive, but I am wrestling with the blues. <laughs> Seems a little, little odd. So how long before the incredible grace of God that has been undeservedly added to our lives is forgotten, set aside, or rewritten? The Apostle Paul spoke passionately about this habit, this common temptation, in the second chapter of Galatians. He said, I do not set aside the grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. I don't set aside the grace of God. And I wish that I could speak with the same conviction that Paul writes to the Galatian church, but I'm afraid that I sometimes do set aside the grace of God. Maybe you do too. Uh, perhaps the post-Easter blues isn't that unusual after all. I recently watched a short documentary on Apple TV called The Bloody Hundredth. Anybody here seen the bloody hundredth? No one. And in fact, I've heard nobody uses Apple TV. So that's why none of you have seen it. But the bloody hundredth was great. Uh, it tells the true stories of the uh, World War II airmen who belonged to the 100th bomb group. And many of these men inspired then a TV series uh, called Masters of the Air. If you've seen Band of Brothers or the Pacific, Masters of the Air is the third one in this installment. And so Masters of the Air then picks up on what we learn in this documentary, and it tells the story of the role that this particular bomb group played in defeating Hitler and his Nazis, their involvement in D-Day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so celebrated journalist Tom Brokaw, uh, if you're old enough to remember him, declared that these men and women who grew up in this World War II era and the Great Depression, who contributed to the economic stability and the comfort of the middle class through that second half of the 20th century, Brokaw called them the greatest generation. And I've often agreed, when you look at what, what they went through, the unique time of history that they lived. And as I was watching this documentary, I admit I was quite inspired again by what this generation accomplished. And if I'm quite honest, um, I was even a little bit embarrassed to be a part of the millennial generation in comparison. Uh, my generation is most known for living in their parents' basement and deciding that truth was relative while launching a video game career. That's the, that's the millennials. <laughs> that's our contribution. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then we would just add, that then sometime after disclosing our intentions for our video game career, having incredibly hurt feelings, if anybody suggested that wasn't a good idea. The greatest generation, on the other hand, defeated what is arguably the greatest war machine since the Roman Empire. And the victory provided Canada, of course, and the United States a relatively comfortable life for decades. Uh, homes were affordable. I remember when my grandpa bought his home for 30 grand. You can't buy a Honda Civic for 30 grand today. Uh, jobs were in abundance. The middle class was large, unlike today in which it is 
disappearing. Life looked, we could say, a lot like Saturday. Coca-Cola was enjoyed behind the security of a white picket fence while grilling burgers and watching three kids play in the yard. And this wasn't just a construct of Norman Rockwell. This was a reality for many families living in North America. And then many of those families who lived this life were thankful for the sacrifices of these brave men and women who protected their right to freedom and then their right to enjoy freedom going forward. Now, like many a sacrificial gift, not everyone appreciates the sacrifice. Not everyone appreciates the generosity or wants to live their life or the life we could say that the gift made possible. So a fascinating example of this from this generation is Jack Kerouac. I've talked to him about him with you before. I find him to be a very interesting pop culture figure. So Kerouac is born in 1922. He comes to age, well, at university during the Second World War. And he finds himself uh, comfortable amongst the artists and the poets and the bohemians. Have you ever heard of the beatniks? Jack Kerouac is like kind of the author of the beatniks. You don't have the hippies if you don't have the beatniks. And Kerouac is like the pope of the beatniks. And so this guy and his group of peers become very disenchanted with the way that the world is going. Unlike the guy grilling burgers in the backyard with Coke and kids, he's pursuing a different Coke <laughs> outside of the white picket fence, not looking to have children. And while everyone else is looking at crew cuts and families, Nine to five jobs as goodness and freedom. Kerouac and his buddies saw it as a prison of materialism and secularism and shallowness. And so they did what they thought was best. And rather than settle down and build roots, they hit the road. And they went on like a, like a many year long bender road trip, uh, rejecting the common way of life, running away from America the beautiful. And so over the course of a few years, they travel all over the United States, participating in every vice an act of debauchery that we could name, and then some we couldn't quite imagine. It was a wild trip. And Kerouac's road trips then become the inspiration for a classic novel written by him called On the Road. Uh, Indigo describes it like this, the classic novel of freedom and the search for authenticity that defined a generation. Freedom and authenticity, Kerouac's greatest pursuit, but not by way of the gift that so many of his generation died to give. Freedom and authenticity through their own idea. So Kerouac dies really young. Uh, though he did find redemption later in life, his body paid the price for his heart's longing for freedom. So why am I telling you this? Because I think that Kerouac's life illustrates that people will go to great, dangerous, and unnecessary lengths to feel free, to feel secure, to feel safe. We could say to no grace. People will kick against a genuine, true, authentic establishment of grace, longing for something else. And while this is true of life in general, it is absolutely true of life in a spiritual sense. So God has offered the supreme sacrifice. His son crucified on a cross. He's won the ultimate victory. The resurrection from the grave and the defeat of death. And today he sent his spirit to indwell every single believer who would receive by faith this gift. And his spirit then in this moment helps us to live in grace. To live out grace. His spirit empowers us and convicts us and comforts us and leads us. Gives us wisdom. It helps us live well. And for many, this is the greatest gift, God's grace. But for others, they reject the sacrificial gift. They reject the victory. And they wander through life looking for something better. As I've said, today is the Sunday after Easter. And though many, if not all of us here, are on the right side of God's gift of grace, we aren't trying to intentionally reject it. We do have a habit of setting aside the grace of God fairly quickly. We celebrate grace on Easter and then we quickly revert to our various distorted versions of the gospel quite quickly. 
So this morning what I'm going to do is offer us a fairly simple, uh, I hope this isn't complicated, uh, consideration of how we remain in God's sacrificial grace, how we live in the victory, rather than deserting it for a distorted gospel. If you want to uh, follow in your Bible, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 1. I've preached on Galatians 1 to you before. But it was during the pandemic. And I barely remember preaching it. So I really suspect you don't remember what I said. <laughs> Beginning in verse 1, we'll read through 12. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Paul's not messing around here. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Wow. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So that's the intro to the letter of Galatians. Uh, the letter begins like Paul's other letters. He greets his readers. But then Paul does something that he does not do in any of his other letters. He omits a prayer or his usual comments on thanksgiving. And he expresses astonishment and he jumps right into the problem. The unusual urgency that we see in Paul's letter to the Galatians points to the deep level of concern he had regarding the Galatians' shaky understanding of grace. Uh, misunderstanding grace is a serious problem in Paul's eyes, obviously, and so it should be for us. And so before I work through this passage, I want to just define grace, what Paul was so concerned that the Galatians were walking away from. So what is grace? Uh, it's a Greek word uh, spelt C-H-A-R-I-S, so it would sound like charis, but you don't say char, you just say the ch. So it's charis. When boiled down to a sentence, this Greek word is translated like this. Grace is God's unmerited favor upon us. If you were to underline something in there, you'd want to underline God's, and you'd want to underline unmerited favor upon us. So grace is, as you know, quite broad in how it functions in our life. The biggest role grace plays is, of course, salvation, leading us to God, leading us to Jesus saving us, and then also how we remain in him and then live out our life in his character and in his image. But because we are so prone to earning and achieving and accomplishing and competing and struggling and outdoing, we don't very easily understand free gifts. We don't understand unmerited favor. That cannot be earned through effort or accomplishment. Nothing else in life is like this. I mean, we try to talk about that, you know, our love for our children is unconditional. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, I get it. You feel a lot of love when your kids are born. But there are moments where, you know, our kids could go to a place where that relationship is severed in a way that God's love for us would never be severed. Because we don't have God's heart. We can't love without conditions. 
So Galatians is timeless. The first truth Paul makes then about remaining in God's grace rather than deserting God's grace is that we have to come to a place where we are convinced that the gospel, that the grace of God has no equal, has no rival. There's nothing better. There's nothing equal to it. It is above all. Verse 6 to 7, he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. In half of verse 7, which is really no gospel at all. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. So as I mentioned, Paul jumps into this letter expressing astonishment. That the Galatians would desert the one who's called them to live in grace. The word deserting is an interesting one uh, because it implies picking up and leaving. Uh, to, to desert is different than just saying like, okay, I've made a decision, I'm going to be moving on, goodbye, you know, you do your farewell tour and then you hit the road. Deserting is like you do it in the middle of the night when no one's watching. It's to abandon. It's to go somewhere else. But it's also to like leave something behind. Uh, the Greek word that's translated as deserting Adds a little bit more color here. So it's a Greek word, metatitheme, and it means to bring to another place or to transfer one's allegiance. The word was used to describe a soldier's revolt or desertion or to describe men who changed politics or philosophy. And it was essentially used to describe a turncoat, someone we could say guilty of treason. Additionally, this Greek word, deserting, is in the present tense. It's not in the past tense. Which tells us that the Galatians haven't completely deserted God and His grace, but they're in the process of doing so. Paul writes to them, well, they're still like packing their bags, so to speak. They're getting ready to go. And all of this desertion preparation has left Paul astonished. Astonished that they're doing this and that they're doing it so quickly. Now remember, Paul's someone who's been personally rocked by God's grace. Both in his own salvation, but also in his call to apostleship. If you read the rest of chapter 1 Galatians, you'll see him talk about this. Furthermore, Paul's personally witnessed the impact or, or the significant reception of these Gentiles in Galatia to the gospel of grace. Not so long before this letter was written. Uh, we went through the book of Acts. In Acts 13, verse 48. Luke records that when the Gentiles in Galatia heard this, they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord. But now these Galatians are deserting the one who calls them to live in the grace of Christ. Now notice verse 6. Paul doesn't just say deserting grace, but deserting the one who called them to live in the grace of God. He places the desertion of God's grace in the same category as deserting God himself. When we get a little bit legalistic, imagine if that was our mentality. I'm not just deserting a theology, I'm deserting God himself. Now, it's of course worth asking, why would the Galatians do this? Why would they be in the process of deserting God's grace? A grace that they had received with joy and that they'd honored the word of the Lord. Well, they would desert God's grace for the same reason any of us desert God's grace. They aren't convinced about it. They aren't convinced that the gospel of grace has no equal. They aren't convinced that there isn't a better way. They are not convinced that it cannot get better than this. J.I. Packer wrote about Christians deserting grace like this. He said, what is it that hinders so many who profess to believe in grace from really doing so? Great question. Why does the theme mean so little? even to some who talk about it a great deal. The root of the trouble seems to be misbelief about the basic relationship between a person and God, misbelief rooted not just in the mind, but in the heart, at the deeper level of things that we never question because we always take them for granted. Misbelief about the basic relationship between a person and God. That could be pre-salvation relationship. That could be post-salvation relationship. Misbelief. 
And it's caused the Galatians, just like it has caused us at times, to believe that there was a better truth or a fuller gospel than what Paul had preached to them. The lie they had believed was that there was a better way to experience God's favor than simply by receiving in faith. They believed that there was more that they could be doing to know God's unmerited favor on their life. How does that work? And so as we read this short verse, it could or maybe should cause us to consider not just why the Galatians are deserting God's grace, but how often we do the same. Like the Galatians, we are easily convinced that God's grace is too good to be true. We're convinced it's too easy. We question the value of God's grace through Jesus because we didn't earn it. Therefore, we start attempting to add to it. And even demanding that others add to it in their life too so that it becomes fuller. And we too easily come to believe a lie that says God's grace should be calculable and it should be achievable and it should be something that we can accomplish like a task or a chore. And if we do this and we do that and we do the other thing, then God's unmerited favor is on my life. And if it's not, it's because I must have done the thing I was supposed to do to earn it. Don't tell me you haven't believed that at one time in your life. Good Christians. This is something us evangelicals say. Oh, they're good Christians. It's starting to make me kind of crazy, to be honest. This designation, good Christian. We label some Christians as good because they follow all the rules. And they pray and they trust God differently than we do or at different moments than we do. Meanwhile, those who honestly struggle, slip up, doubt, watch secular movies and TV, and listen to music with swears in it, are not good Christians, or something. There's no such thing as good Christians. Either a person is in Christ and saved, or they're not. Jesus himself said there is no one good but the Father. There are different levels of Christian maturity, different levels of sanctification, I'm cool with that. There's nothing that makes us good by our behavior. We are utterly ruined. We're wretches apart from God's grace. And I would just add to that, because we're largely an evangelical group who you know, lived out our Christian experience in evangelicalism. Evangelical moralism doesn't equal mature Christians either. The Pharisees crushed it at moralism. They're hypocrites. And they were just as failed and broken and sinful as the adulterers and the murderers and everybody else. Evangelical moralism doesn't make you more favored than those who wrestle. And condemning everyone who sins differently than they did, the Pharisees come to be called whitewashed tombs. Good on the outside, dead on the inside. All this to say grace is a foreign gift to us. It's unusual. And the experience of God's grace in our ever-competitive, hustling, honoring culture. And because we don't know how to accept a gift that we don't deserve or earn, we tend to set aside the gift for something that we're more familiar with. A little bit of work, a little bit of effort, a little bit of earning, a little bit of excellence. A version of God's grace that works up with our work, work, lines up with our work ethic, or our moralism, or our church traditions. Or our parents' you know, Christian family value list that hung on the fridge beside our school picture. Or a grace that comes because we had a good work ethic like our dad did. Or because we, we lived the good Christian life that our mom told us to live. And if you grew up in evangelicalism, I am certain you know what I'm talking about. Now, am I against hard work and Christ-like character? Like, of course not. I've given my life to challenging people to live like this. But those are not ways in which we earn grace. That's not, that's not where grace comes. We can't earn grace. As soon as we try to earn grace, it's not grace. It's something else. And if we believe that grace needs just a little something else, a little bit of pixie dust, a spoonful of sugar to help that medicine go down, then Galatians, this message applies to us. 
because we, like them, fail to rest in the grace of God. Choosing to desert it for a wasteland mirage of effort, human invention, and glorified churchy habits. Paul goes on, and he teaches us that resting in God's grace requires high standards for our influencers. Second half of verse 7, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Evidently, your life bears evidence that some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So the churches in Galatia are in the process of setting aside the grace of God, in part because of their own weak convictions about how wonderful it is, but also because of the people that they'd given room to speak into their life, the people that they'd allowed to become their friends, their influencers. Weak conviction paired with dangerous influence, weak conviction paired with dangerous influence is a recipe to wander from grace. If you've wandered from grace, if you're on the fence, if you don't know, if you're not in and all, I suspect it was a weak conviction and it was a bad influence. So in the Galatian churches, there arrived a group of teachers who insisted that the Galatians, who were primarily Gentiles, adopt circumcision and the special Jewish days to become Christians. They were saying, if you want God's grace, if you want his unmerited favor on your life, if you want his salvation, if you really want to know God's goodness on your life, then you need to become culturally Jewish because God's plan comes through the Jews. In other words, and this is what's the the saddest part, they were cool with Jesus, like keep him. We're not telling you get rid of Jesus, but also add these steps from our churchy tradition to it. Then you'll be under God's grace. And Paul calls this type of thinking a perversion of the gospel. We're much more gracious today. Like maybe it was bad thinking or or just a misunderstanding. Paul calls it perversion. Perversion of the good news. Not an alternative way, not progressive Christianity, not liberalism, a perversion. Jesus' death and resurrection were entirely and perfectly sufficient. And to add anything to God's plan, the way grace is given, twists it, into something that is perverted and skewed and ugly. And grace begins to unravel and reverse and turn us back into people stuck in a religious hamster wheel trying to earn God's attention based on merit and effort and excellence. And this is what these false teachers are doing. I would like to call them influencers because I think that's a term that our culture is understanding today. False teachers, I mean, I don't know if you have many false teachers in your life, but you probably have more influencers than you can possibly count. Who are your influencers? I mean, we used to have like our dad or our mom and like maybe a teacher and a coach. This was the influence. My children have more influence by people in a day than I could give to them in a lifetime. he calls these influencers gospel perverters. I call our influencers gospel perverters as well. You see, there are people in our life, friends, family, co-workers, millions of influencers on social media who do not see salvation through faith in Jesus as a gift of perfect grace. They either tell you to add to it or they tell you it's not necessary. And like the false teachers who messed up the Galatians, those influencers in our life can sway us to desert God's grace as well. They say clever things. They say interesting things. They say things that sound a little bit like the Bible. Just close enough. Just peeling enough. And yet they're deceptive. You know, one of the trends in Christianity today is is that, especially amongst the younger generations, kind of my age group and down, is this hybrid of Christianity and Buddhism. Because it sounded just, just good enough, just gracious enough. So take what you like from here, take what you like from here, put it together, let's call it grace. Your life has more influences than you can count. So be ever discerning would be the admonishment, would be the challenge. Who are you allowing to shape you? 
we talked about this about a year ago. We had it on our sign outside for a while, but your attention is the beginning of your devotion. What are you giving your attention to? Repeatedly. What are you going back to, looking at it again and again and again and again? And again, eventually that will become your devotion. If you want to stay in God's grace, if you want to rest in God's grace, you have to be very, very careful, church. You always had to be very careful, but perhaps in this age of influence, it has never been more important. We have to be careful who you're listening to. Finally, if you want to rest in God's grace, we want to remember that grace is God's idea. Oh my goodness, this is not a construct of, of, of liberal, post-Christian, enlightened, University professors. Grace is God's idea and grace is God's work. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So you got these theological problems caused by the false teachers. But then you've also got Paul's authority as a messenger of God's grace being scrutinized, it's being questioned, it's being doubted. Uh, the false teachers that caused the Galatians to look at the Apostle Paul and go, oh, I don't know about that guy. Like, he's talking about something. I think he's kind of crazy. I don't know if you should trust him. And because of that, then they're asking, is the, this gospel that Paul's preaching, is this the right one? Is the version of grace that he's proclaiming the one that we want to remain in? And Paul's answer to that question is key to understanding Galatians, but it's actually key to understanding all of Paul's letters, and I would argue all of the Christian faith in general. He preaches the gospel that he preaches, and he trusts that it is right because it is not a construct of humans. It is exclusively God's idea. It's not of human origin, as he says in verse 11. It's not Paul who makes the gospel of grace legitimate and credible and true. It's the God who created it that makes it credible and true. And it's Jesus, the Son of God, who revealed it to Paul. Paul's messenger of grace and his credibility as that messenger is because he's preaching God's message, not his own. Paul has something to say because he's saying something of God. Which is a great metric, by the way, for who we should be willing to listen to if we just look back to what we talked about. Who we allow to listen to our... Uh, to influence our life and who we're listening to? Is what they're saying actually from God? Because if it's not, why are we listening to them? Today we can learn, I think, uh, a critical security from Paul's insistence that remaining in God's grace requires us to hold the conviction that God's grace is not our idea, but it's God. And it's not just generally the God's idea. The one high God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God, the one highest God, true God. Amongst all other religions, spiritualities, gurus, philosophies, doing their best to draw you and me from Yahweh's grace, we want to remember we can only truly know God's grace when we believe that it is Yahweh's idea. Alone. Accomplished through Jesus Christ, His Son, alone. No other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father of grace, my addition, apart from me. No one apart from me. God's given us His grace. He's given us His best idea, and no human can possibly improve on that. As we wrap up, these days of personal truth. Again, that's my generation that gave you that. Pagan spirituality. Human tolerance. Cherished above divine revelation. It is so easy to quickly desert the grace we celebrate and cherish on Easter Sunday for a perverted gospel. There are so many bizarre truths and practices begging us to turn to them instead. Just this week, uh, myself and Chantel and Arlen and Pastor Brianne were watching a documentary show. And 
unexpectedly to us, it, it took a strange turn and did a brief exploration of cryogenic preservation. If you don't know what cryogenic preservation is, don't worry about it. I didn't either. But cryogenic preservation is where you take um, someone who's been declared medically dead and you put them in liquid nitrogen and you preserve their body. Now, there's two ways, there's two options. I didn't know there were options. You can do your whole body or you can do just your head. I think the head's a little cheaper. So just, just the head or the whole body. And the hope is that if you are preserved like this, eventually, you know, evolving enlightened man will come up with a way to resurrect the dead and bring them back to life. So let's just hang out in the deep freeze for a bit. I know we're going to get there, and then you can bring me back to life. Now, amongst the many sad and bizarre points in this little exploration was one man's comments. One man's comments on how living with the hope of the resurrection in his future makes his life more rich now. It's like, dear Lord, like you don't want to be so crass as to ask, are you dumb? But you kind of want to. Like, my God. And here's the crazy thing, church. This company that does this is getting these people to sign their life insurances over to them to take care of them while they're dead. So they're literally even giving like their life into their hands, counting on them to resurrect them. Do you see the deception? This is something demonic, but we call it good science. Rather than looking to Jesus for the hope of resurrection, people are signing up to be frozen in the hopes that people will save them. Little do these people frozen in these chambers know that they're going to have a bodily resurrection. It's coming. The question isn't will they be re resurrected. The question is if they've rejected the grace of God, how long will, they, will their hell be? And I mean, I realize that's harsh, but there's a bodily resurrection for everyone, the living and the dead. Some to eternal life, some to eternal damnation. The resurrection's coming. They didn't have to pay for it. Somebody already did. So I tell you this to give you a current example of how people will set aside the grace of God for a perverted good news. You know, there was even a three-year-old preserved like that. Because the parents had no other hope. That's sad. And that is an extreme example but at the heart, it's no different than the person who abandons God's grace for witchcraft or atheism. It's the same thing. Those are just familiar to us at this point. Or the person who abandons God's grace for nothing in particular, maybe the scariest one of all. They abandon it just for the right to choose their own adventure and walk their own road till they wander into something that seems like it's going to make their life a little bit better. Church, the Sunday after Easter, I want you to remind you, if nothing else, if you've heard nothing else, stay in the grace of God. And don't dismiss that encouragement too quickly, like, yeah, 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 we know. Of course we know that. Because life will give you so many reasons to feel tempted to wander from God's grace, to wander into a gospel in which Jesus' work on the cross for our salvation is rejected. Or, at best, you know, just one ingredient in like our personal wellness stew. Of all these things that make our life favor. Life includes things like marital breakdowns and health challenges and loss of employment and financial setback and five-year plan disruptions and raising kids and past hurts and church hurts and every kind of hurt and hurt people hurting people. Fear of the future. And then our own narcissistic desires where nobody works as hard as we do. Nobody loves the way we love. No one's as committed as we're committed. Nobody sacrifices the way we sacrifice. 
And all of those are excuses to go, God, I need your grace. I better go looking for it. And they, can, they, they lead us to consider deserting God's grace in favor of the current false truth, the cultural solution, or whatever other philosophy makes us feel better for that afternoon. Life's valleys have a way of leading us to question the origin and credibility of the gospel. You know that. Now, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, draw close to your creator in the days of your youth, because there are days approaching where you will say, I find no joy in them. Life rocks us. The problem with looking for grace as something that can be earned or achieved is that we can't. And trying to do so leaves us feeling joyless and exhausted in our life with Jesus. The Jesus who said, come to me if you're weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. And not just rest for the afternoon, soul rest. Well, it doesn't feel like soul rest. That's because you've been trying to earn grace since the day you first heard about it. When we try to earn grace, it becomes a work of the will rather than a work of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but my willpower tank is pretty small. As soon as the will runs out to be a good Christian, which it always does, by the way, rather than resting in God's grace that loves me and has saved me when I didn't deserve it, when I didn't earn it, and it's eternal, when you, when, when you try to earn that, you feel like a failure. And you feel like you've disappointed God. And then you feel like you're not deserving of His grace. And that is sadly a common experience for probably everyone in this room. And it is an awful feeling. So my prayer for you and for me, in the, in the shadow of Easter, in the, in the shadow of the cross, in the shadow of the empty tomb, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we would know again the beauty of that victory that we call Easter, the beauty of it, what it really does. And that rather than us doing the work to put God's favor on us, we would rest in the work of God's Son who did what we couldn't do, that we never could do. The Old Testament is the story of us trying, and it didn't go well. And rather than seeking multiple truths, let's look to the one who came to reveal truth and who said that everyone who's on the side of truth would listen to me. And let's continue to receive then the rest that comes by way of the assurance that God's acceptance and approval of us does not ebb and flow based on our perfection. Rather, God's grace remains consistent and steadily upon you and upon me because it depends only on the perfect and forever finished work of Jesus Christ. If Jesus finished it, why are we still working on it? 